Welcome to the last afternoon talk of this semester. Today we have Gianluca talking about uh, Poseidonia, a Greek colony on the south of Italy, and the Lucanians, which are the local population that was there before and after. Uh, a few words, uh, we want to thank the Finnish Institute of Molecular Medicine for sponsoring the venue. And just to, can you pass the slide? Oui. Yes. Maybe. There's always technical problems with these things. <laughs> Yeah. There we go. Just a few words about the science basement. We are a volunteer based organization that focuses on giving a safe space for early career researchers to communicate their science. And we have several projects going on. You can find us in these links in case you want to get in contact for volunteering. Uh, we have several partnerships with doctoral schools for credits or just to be a brave one and you know write about your research or your science uh, in written form. We have the blog, we have a podcast, or giving a talk. Um, but yes, with this, let's get it started. I will hand the floor to Gianluca, and we can dig into the bottom of side. Team. Team. Oh, and the team. <laughs> Sorry guys, the sun is too bright today. So yes, this is our team for the afternoon talks. Uh, today with us we have uh, Rita, Marco and Lea helping. Um, but as I said before, we're always happy to accept new volunteers. So please do get in contact after the talk or by email. Hello? Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone, and thanks to be here to this talk. And uh, also, greetings to those people who are connected remotely. And thanks to the Science Basement Group for having invited me to this, uh, to this talk. And um, the title of the talk is uh, Poseidonia, Greeks, Non-Greeks, and Religious Cults. Uh, I'll tell you about a little bit about myself. And uh, my name is uh, Gianluca De Martino. I am a doctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki, uh, where I'm um, now conducting my uh, PhD research. And uh, uh, the research is actually in the process of, uh, of a preliminary examination, and uh, it has I just got the two positive uh, reports, so soon, hopefully, I will get the grant for the uh, permission for uh, public defense. And um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, uh, my BA concerned the topography of the cities of Campania, which is the region around Naples in southern Italy in, the late, in late antiquity, let's say third, uh, sixth century AD. AD. And so I am interested in, in topography, uh, ancient topography, and uh, my master, master concerned the, the religious administration and the rituals of the sanctuary of goddess Demeter in Eleusis, which is near Athens. Now, Demeter was a goddess related to fertility in antiquity, and, uh, and this reflects another interest of mine in the, for, the, for uh, ancient uh, female goddesses of Mediterranean. And uh, well, I am, maybe you understood, I am a, a researcher who, who is interested in classical archaeology, that is the archaeology of the Roman and Greek ancient world. And here in this picture, it's me in a, in a pit and uh, I was digging, a, a, actually, this is a garden from uh, the house of Marcus Lucretius in Pompeii in southern Italy. And uh, I was there with the uh, EPU project, the university project of the University of Helsinki. And I was there uh, 
And uh, now you can see me, but in the end, uh, you couldn't have seen me anymore. I mean, the pit was like uh, more than two meters uh, deep, deep. And uh, I found, I think, there are 80 kilos on wall uh, paintings. And that uh, Because the Roman owners of the house decided that they, uh, after a, an earthquake, they decided that they wanted to change the actual outlook of the house so they to create this uh, this uh, this garden which was uh, elevated on the level of the street they 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 made it with their wall paintings so basically it was a pit full of that we are talking today about a greek colony a greek colony named poseidonia uh, a little a few words about uh, colonies and about the greek colonists in 8th century bc uh, Greece, Greece had uh, um, an increase of population, maybe due possibly to better, better uh, agricultural methods. And uh, the Greeks uh, thought to overcome this problem by sending their excessive population around, creating new settlements. And we see that these settlements were all over the ancient Mediterranean. We can see a lot of them on the, in the Black Sea area, uh, Northern Africa, Spain, France. But uh, the, the country or the, the area which was more colonized uh, beside Greece in the ancient Mediterranean was, was Italy. It was near, it was a fertile area. And uh, the Greeks created a lot of, a lot of colonies there and uh, actually, this, this, these colonies became even more wealthy than those that they were in, uh, in, the, in the many cities that were in uh, mainland Greece, actually. And Poseidonia is one of them here, south of Neapolis, modern Naples, which was also a Greek colony. And uh, Poseidonia was a sub-colony, which means that their mother colony, which was Sibaris, here, it was another colony, became so wealthy that created by itself more colonies. And uh, Poseidonia is in an area which is, uh, was inhabited by other populations, Italic populations and the Etruscans. The Etruscans were this Indo-European population, not non-Indo-European population, which settled uh, central Northern Italy and um, then they came south. Uh, it actually also had the power in some point to uh, occupy Rome and one of the, some of the kings uh, of Rome were actually Etruscans. So the Etruscans came south and they uh, created uh, settlements with these Italic populations, uh, the Oscans. And uh, actually the area around where these, these colonies uh, of uh, Greek colonies were built, were inhabited by uh, non-Greek people. So they were already there, these populations. And uh, one of them was the Lucanians, which also belonged to this, uh, to this uh, Italic people. The Etruscans and these Italic people, they created the multicultural society, which also we we'll see I think it reflected also on the Poseidonia, and I will try to show how. So this is a map of, uh, of Southern Nemo, the satellite, and it is A here, it's where Poseidonia was located. And Poseidonia is very dear to my heart because uh, I was born in uh, Salerno, which is like uh, 30 kilometers north of Poseidonia. And it's the provincial capital of the area. And uh, I remember very fondly these uh, Sunday evenings when I was, uh, well, afternoons when I was basically forcing my parents to take me to the site when I was a little child. So and this is, <laughs> it was one of the reasons why I wanted to research this. And uh, other reasons were maybe the actual, the actual scientific, scientific reason was this, that uh, these Italic populations in due time, they took over the city of Poseidonia. They took over the city of Poseidonia, the first signs that, uh, that the shift of population was changing, it's around 540 
before Christ. So Posidonia was uh, established in uh, 600 before Christ, but they were there already. But modern research until a few day, decades ago, they've uh, underestimated their input. So there, there are several reasons. It's, it's a very long thing, but uh, mostly because Greek and later Roman culture, they have been so considered so superior in that way. Uh, the input of the local populations, the non-Greek populations in this case, they were, were underestimated. And that bothered me, really, because I thought that how is it possible that these people are vanished? How is it possible that these people became just Greek and everything that they did was to become Greek? Can it be, could it be so? Here are the Greek colonies in those round, uh, uh, in those circles, and uh, I, I sent them there. And uh, we see that they were all spread all over the, 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 the coasts because of maritime trade. Uh, but the inland was inhabited by north of the river Sele, there was the Etruscans there near Salerno and the Campanians, which were also related to these Lucanians and the inlands, they were inhabited by the Lucanians, which were also Italic. They all shared the same language, basically. They had uh, maybe a regional, uh, regional differences, but they all shared the same language, the same religion. So what if, what, what these uh, Lucanians uh, did? I mean, uh, th this was the question. What, what, they went there and they just accepted Greek, uh, Greek culture without doing, uh, giving any input to the life of this colony. And that I did. I wanted to, to, to research because I, I thought that it wasn't so. Uh, so what I basically did, I did a thing with, which is strange to uh, maybe to, 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 to talk about because in a way it, it, it should have been obvious, but it wasn't because the cultural, um, cu cultural perspective of the, of the researches was already shifted towards Greek culture. So I, I went to research not only Poseidonia, this is an aerial view of Poseidonia, and uh, this is the area of the sanctuaries. Uh, I went to research the inland of Lucania to see which were the features which these Lucanians had in their culture. And if these could be found in the Pestan uh, material culture, it hasn't been done before because everybody has just assumed that this is a Greek city. And even if the Lucanians arrived there, they didn't do anything else than become Greek. Moreover, I did also this. I wanted to research this, uh, if there were this, um, this, uh, mm, these features were present in cult. And why is that? Uh, cult, of course, it's a very uh, researched uh, subject in uh, Greek colonies. And uh, also because cult is always thought to be, of course, a very conservative uh, phenomenon of human customs. And, uh, it's often is defining of ethnicity. So if changes can be detected, uh, detected in cult, then there are significant changes. And what I did was to uh, research the material culture of the cult of uh, one goddess, uh, the main goddess of Poseidonia, which is Hera, uh, the wife of Zeus, uh, Roman Juno, uh, 35,000 um, uh, clay figurines were dedicated to Hera in the, uh, in the sanctuaries of Pestum. And when there was two seasons, uh, uh, basically in the, in the basement of the Museum of Pestum, and I went, uh, I went through this material to see if the typologies showed differences during the time. 30, no, not, not all of them. I tried to find uh, like diagnostic uh, uh, finds. These ones, the, the ones that could, uh, mm, that could be enough uh, of the one typology so that I could actually detect a change in time. 
not uh, unfortunately if i would <laughs> have more time i would have <laughs> well, i would have loved to see them all <laughs> but uh, that's that's an unfortunate thing and um, so what these lucanians did I, the lucanians uh, the only thing which researchers gave as uh, they, they, they admitted the lucanians did was to uh, bury their dead in painted tombs not all the lucanians of course also those what, just those that they belonged to the elite of the Lucanian people. But also in this case, immediately when some uh, better uh, painted tomb was found, uh, researchers uh, uh, assumed that it was Greek because why the Luganians would have done such a sophisticated picture, uh, with the sophisticated uh, painting, uh, although Greeks didn't uh, paint their tombs in Poseidonia. That is uh, strange, but that is goes. Uh, probably the most famous artifact of Pestum is the, on the left side, there is the tomb of the diver. And uh, how this, our research has worked for many decades. Uh, and the tomb of the diver was found in 1969. And immediately it was uh, a huge uh, sensation because uh, uh, researchers thought that this is a Greek, Greek tomb, painted tomb. Uh, we see in an ab abstract atmosphere, a man who is uh, diving into water and the researchers started to think which kind of Greek philosophy there is behind this and why this man is diving into the water. And probably the explanation is this, uh, the, this, this symbolizes the man passing to the afterworld and is plunging into eternity, if we could say so. But on the right side, this is an Etruscan tomb. tomb. Uh, it's not to, as well preserved as the tomb of the diver. Uh, what we see here is another diving man. It's a, diff, a little bit different uh, environment. Of course, there are birds. And then on the right side, down there, there is a, a little fishing boat with two people fishing. and. Uh, but the uh, idea is the same. The man is plunging into eternity. So this team, it's not originally Greek. This right side tomb, of course, it's older. The Lucanians learned, or I don't want to say learned, but uh, were inspired by the, by the Etruscans because they lived together, the Campanians and the Lucanians. And these are Lucanians, Lucanian tombs also from Poseidonia. The Greeks didn't paint the tombs, but the Lucanian did. did. But, and the tomb of the diver must have been a Lucanian tomb. So we see like fighting scenes or the return of the warrior, they are all related to death and the, the afterward or honoring the warriors. So here is another how mindset of the researchers has worked for many decades. So, what I did, I went to research sanctuaries and uh, Lucanian sanctuaries, actually, in the inland. And I started to see how, where, which were the most important architectural features of the Lucanian sanctuaries of inland. They had the combination of roofed and unroofed spaces, because for the Italic populations, uh, the sky was an important uh, part of the of, of, um, of rituals and the Etruscans had the same thing. Uh, the Romans had the same thing before they started to build temples. Uh, the landscape was taken into the, into the rituals, rivers fertility, for fertility uh, rituals, uh, vegetation, everything was in, in all, all the agrarian landscape of Lucania was taken into into the into the rituals they didn't have temple struct, uh, temple like structures like the greek temples or the roman temples uh, but they had a small square building which hosted the house the the statue of the deity and the gifts for the sanctuary and then they had the central courtyard surrounded by porticos and rooms used for the performance of ritual meal 
the ritual meal was a really important uh, a part of the Lucanian ritual. Even the, the Greeks said it too, but it was not so pervasive and it was not so uh, part of the ritual uh, in, in a way that everything was done so that the ritual ended with this uh, common meal. In Greece too there was, but uh, here it was so pervasive. Uh, and then the pre presence of streaming water, water channeling springs because for fertility rituals. And then there were ritual paths. All the sanctuaries be, were built so in order to uh, um, let the people walk from one place to another in the ritual. So they entered, then they went into a sort of procession, and then there was the, 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 the sacrifices, and then there was the ritual meal, and then they went out. I'll show you, oh, I'll show you, uh, this is the, largest, this is a tridimensional, tridimensional picture of the largest Lucanian sanctuary of the inland, which is, uh, if one sees the Greek sanctuaries, looks very modest. But here are all the features we were talking, except the square building. This one didn't have a square building, or at least it hasn't been never found. Uh, here is the place where the people entered to get in the courtyard. In the center, there are two uh, altars where the sacrifices were held. And then on the both sides, right side, uh, left side and the right side, there are porticos and then rooms, which could have used for the ritual meal. And then there is a water channeling going on this side next to the... So here, here is how it looks, uh, a Lucanian uh, sanctuary. Lucanian ritual, a religion, so the common ritual meal, the ritual washing, burning of incenses, seeds, offering of first fruits to the deity. All these are related to agriculture, fertility. They were the main things because it was a place for agriculture. It was a rural land. Uh, so it was related uh, to the agrarian world that has strong fertility and tonic characteristics. I explained tonic is, uh, means uh, related to gods of the underworld. So basically not in our sense what we think about evil gods. No, they were just gods who protect, who oversaw the death, but they were also related to life. Not, they were not uh, just related to death. The god of the underworld was uh, a god related also to fertility because death and life belong to cycles of life. Uh, so the deities reflected these features. And then there was the syncretism in many areas uh, connected to uh, of identification of, so syncretism means the identification of non-Greek gods with Greek ones. In, in antiquity, it was very common because like, if you think like Zeus and uh, Thor, they are both the fathers of gods and uh, they all have the, their symbol is uh, uh, the thunder and uh, they, they, they share the certain features. And in the border areas, these features were even more uh, mixed. So it was already normal for a Lucanian to think like that a Greek god could have a counterpart in this. So they were more prone, both of them were more prone to accept other gods. So that's how it works. And that's what I, I think it happened also in, in Poseidonia, but let's see. So here we see how uh, the sanctuary where the cult of Hera in Poseidonia was staged, how it, uh, um, it looked, not all these features are actually, architectural features are uh, um, Greek, actually not. All, all the left side, it's, uh, built in the Roman period when the Romans built the forum and they changed the topography of the place. So uh, in the Greek period and then in the Lucanian period, there were much less structures than this. The, of course, the temples were Greek of the Doric order. The one on the right side uh, with A, marked A is the temple of Hera, which is the oldest one. And, it, uh, and here thousands of these figurines of the goddess have been found. In the circles now, I have uh, marked structures which were built in the Lucanian period. 
and which have might um, show how uh, the Lucanians added those features which we were talking about before uh, for Lucanian sanctuaries um, here also. Now we have to think that, of course, this was a different sanctuary. This uh, sanctuary had the other uh, important buildings. So it, this is was an unprecedented uh, example for the Lucanians. Uh, they didn't have a city. So when they took this over, they didn't destroy things. They took them, but they shaped them according to their rituals. So here on the left side, next to the temple B, which is maybe a temple of Apollo, uh, we see a row of 13 altars. Uh, they are not re related to any temple. Uh, and the Lucanians didn't have temple structures. So this was built in the Lucanian period uh, around the fourth century BC. So the Lucanians built those 13 altars, uh, 13 it's a number of uh, gods, which is uh, common in the Lucanian uh, and, and Italic uh, religion. So they are uh, built in a direction, north-south, in order to convey people from north to the, to, the to the actual place where there were the sacrifices. Then above the, the temple uh, marked with A, Again, there is a circle, which I made a red circle, and there are two structures. And uh, on one, there are very deep uh, um, channeling systems, and they are both related to consumption of food. So there were holes where, they were, where a common meal was staged. And uh, researchers have always thought that these are unusual for Greek architecture, but they have never connected it. They were built in the Lucanian period, but because according to them, the Lucanians didn't do anything else than become Greek. They just were thinking why they look like this, what was their purpose and why they were built. But it makes sense if you think like they are made for Lucanians who lived in the city. And then on the left side, again, uh, bottom, we see another place with a huge, rather large fireplace for burning of a meal. And it's built on top of an area where uh, deities of the underworld were, uh, were, were worshipped. And we know that because uh, many figurines of, uh, uh, of worshippers holding a piglet were found. And the piglet was an animal which, is, which was related to the gods of the underworld. Another sanctuary of a, dedicated to Hera was changed in this way uh, very profoundly during the Lucanian period. Here we see the temple of Hera. Well, actually, the only thing here that it's Greek, it's the temple and the two altars there. Uh, the, Thesauros, which means the treasury was built in the Roman period. All the others are built in the, in the Lucanian period. And in the Lucanian period, there was, uh, there was built a stoa, which means a portico, again, a portico uh, on, the, on the southern side and on the northern side uh, of the complex. And then on the northern side, where there, there is the stoa, northern stoa, uh, two other structures a kitchen and a hall were built so as to form a sort of uh, courtyard. And here again, the common meal. And uh, as you see, those, those uh, little structures na uh, named uh, botros with the Greek uh, terminology, again, Greek terminology, there are two of them next to the temple and next to the complex uh, there on the north. Uh, they were filled with the sacrificial meat, um, meat. Uh, bones, and uh, there are signs of uh, bones of dogs, cockerels, and piglets, which are again related to the gods of the underworld. Uh, and then on the right side, there is a square building. And here, the only cult statue of Hera was found, and it was storaged there, like in many Luganian sanctuaries. And then again, and here again, the researchers have always thought why there is this uh, square building here. Why is there? What, what it is about? 
and uh, it was just a mystery. And uh, I think it remains a mystery, but uh, you have, it has to be taken into consideration that it has the same function than in the Lucanian sanctuaries. So why it wouldn't be a Lucanian uh, feature? And then here again, we can see the path. Uh, we can see the path, a possible path, ritual path, like in the Lucanian sanctuaries of Inland. The people entered here, the, uh, entered the sanctuary from the south, went to the area where the temple was, and then uh, there were sacrifices and the rituals, and then uh, they walked to the northern side where there was the consumption of meal. One thing that's to be noted also that there is a sharp increase in finds in, uh, of kitchenware during the, in sanctuaries during the Lucanian period in all the area of Poseidonia. And that's exactly because the common meal became so important feature in the sanctuaries. So the, the Lucanians embraced these cults, but they put their own features in that. And uh, they, they embraced the cult of Era. Uh, and then I thought like, why is, is so? They could have just not embraced the cult of Era. They could have brought their own gods. And I started to think that there are features which are common in the, in the, in the, in the, in the gods. So I, here is a, a division of Hera. She had uh, wider religious traits than the Hera of the Homeric poems. If you have read the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, Hera is there, uh, is very vengeful goddess. She's the wife of uh, Zeus and uh, she's always is, um, punishing the lovers of her uh, husband. And that's basically a role in there. But it, in um, Greek mainland, it was a very old, even predated Zeus. Uh, so she probably wasn't the wife of Zeus when uh, in a ve very, very ancient times. She had the wider specter of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, features. She was a goddess of fertility, of marriage, and she had a, a very marked um, tonic, so underworld character uh, related both to underworld and the earth cycles. Here we see her with the pomegranate, which is a fruit, a fruit of, which for the Greeks uh, was a sign of death and life. Then I started to, to see uh, the best known Lucanian goddess, which could have uh, matched maybe Hera and had, have uh, some of her traits, was Mephitis. She was actually the main goddess of Lucanian religion. And in antiquity, in the Roman, so at least slightly later, um, uh, la later uh, sources, she was associated with Juno. And Juno was the Latin Hera. So already there was this sort of semantic religious uh, association between the two goddesses, also with Venus and Minerva. So they, these were all great mothers of the Mediterranean. Well, uh, uh, not maybe Minerva, but Venus and Juno were. She shared with Hera the attributes of companion of Zeus, Jupiter for the Latins, uh, protection over cycles of life, vegetation, fertility, and the agrarian world, and tonic world. So they were very similar. And the Lucanians were accepting this, this uh, uh, were accepting this uh, cult because it reminded it. It reminded uh, Mephitis, which was their main goddess. I show you this uh, example of how subtle this research has to be to understand what is the Lucanian input in this, uh, these things, because uh, many features are similar. On the left side, we see uh, Hera from the Greek period. We see her with the, on the uh, left side, she, uh, on, the, on the right uh, hand, she has the pomegranate, which for the Greeks was a, a fruit of death and life. And on the left hand, she probably held a patera, which is a dish which was served for uh, pouring uh, libation to the gods of the underworld. So basically water, wine, milk was poured on the, on the earth. On the right side, we see the elaboration of the same, uh, the same, uh, the same iconography uh, in the Lucanian period. This seems a very, 
minor detail. We see the goddess sitting again frontally, and uh, this time the patera, the dish, is on the right side, and on the left side she has a bowl of fruit. It's a generic bowl of fruit. Uh, this is just uh, seems a minor detail, but uh, the, the pomegranate in the Lucan for the Lucanians was related only to that. But this image wants to show instead uh, agriculture, fertility. So this minor detail might signal a very uh, much more deeper uh, religious cult, um, uh, cultic uh, uh, change in the society. Uh, here we can see another Lucanian tomb and uh, the pomegranates are there on the right side uh, of, uh, above. And uh, moreover, uh, a typology of this goddess with the, with, the, with the bowl of fruit was also created with the goddess with the pomegranate, but this time they were set in the tombs. So this is a change. It is a change. It's very subtle, but it's a change. Then again, in the Lucanian period, the importance of motherhood and fertility increased. On the left side, we see again an elaboration of the sitting goddess, and uh, it's uh, not uh, uh, very well preserved, but uh, in, in a way that uh, the, the infant which is suckling there, it's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't show very well. It's here, and she has a breast uh, bare. She, she's suckling the infant. Uh, there are more crude uh, versions of this made in, uh, in the Campanian areas, in the Locanian areas. And uh, we have to think also that this, this, uh, these figurines were found also in Lucanian sanctuaries of the inland. So the imagery was shared. And uh, then again, it's a question why, why it hasn't been done, this sort of comparison between sanctuaries of inland Lucania and the Greek sanctuaries. Then again, there is Hera with Zeus sitting again, and fertility, it was a key. And then the gods of the underworld, even in the cult of Hera, in, increased un, uh, the tonic underworld features increased. On the left side, we see an incense seed burner. We say that the burning of seeds and offering of seeds to the, to the gods uh, was an important, uh, uh, feature of Lucanian uh, religion. So on the left side, we see a figure of a woman, a bust of a woman with the, um, with the, with the, with the flower sprouting from her head. And the, actually the seeds were put in the flower part and they were burned. And this is a indication of this ritual. And on the right side, again, there is just a bust of a woman. Now the reduction of the particularly of the female figure, uh, is a symbol, sim symbolic representation of the gods of the underworld, because here the, 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 the figure is coming from the earth, from down earth. And these were, were found also in the Lucanian inlands, not only in Poseidonia. And this is again a sign of the increasing of the importance of chthonic underworld rituals. Now, a few conclusions about this uh, research. And uh, what we have seen that uh, Lucanians constructed the several buildings for construction, uh, for consumption of meal, and they furnished with water channeling systems for uh, conveyance of water in the uh, shrines. There has been the, can be detected the possible presence of ceremonial paths in the urban area and uh, at Foce del Sele, which is the other sanctuary that I show. And uh, the, the Greek uh, cults continued as cathed, and but uh, they even tried, thrived according to the record in the Luganian period. And this was possible because of this uh, fusion of the two cultures. Uh, also tonic, so underworld gods rituals increased in the Luganian period. Uh, and this is attested in many uh, aspects, uh, deposition in dedicatory pits. So they, these figurines were actually buried in the earth. And this is another sign of the connection of the earth and the underworld. 
uh, sacrifices of animals related to underworld deities like dogs, cockers, and piglets, and uh, clay figurines, like uh, those flower women and uh, figurines of deities and worshippers with piglets and bust of, busts of female figures. Uh, the figure of Hera, uh, as the other deities, acquired more of the traits, traits related to the agrarian world and to fertility and to the sphere of the underworld as a consequence of the Lucanian, of Lucanian influence. I believe that uh, this, this sort of approach is important to show uh, the, the interaction between people and population in antiquity. And I think that this uh, old approach, which in my opinion, it has been like uh, colonialistic, should be rejected. Or at least should be taken into consideration what local populations of Italy, other than the Greeks and the Romans, did for the development of these settlements. I think this would be beneficial also for understanding all this, uh, uh, all the dynamics of the Greek colonization and how it worked actually in practice. A final word just for the, I thank my supervisor, Professor Mika Kayava. He's a professor of Greek language and literature here at the University of Helsinki and he, he has worked on actually on epigraphic material from uh, Pestum and uh, Poseidonia. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, he, he knew the subject very well already. And also he's an es expert in uh, ancient cults. And uh, also my th deep thanks to Finnish Cultural Foundation and to the University of Helsinki, namely uh, the, 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 the Faculty of Art, which have granted me uh, grants to to dedicate myself to this uh, research 100% of my time for uh, several years. So I thank you all. This was the presentation. And uh, now I believe uh, we, we continue with the yes, de debate. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much.